Now our reading from God's Word comes from Genesis 39, verses 1 through 23. Now Joseph had been taken down to Egypt. Potiphar, an Egyptian, who was one of the Pharaoh's officials, the captain of the guard, brought him from the Ishmaelite who had taken him there. The Lord was with Joseph, so that he prospered, and he lived in the house of the Egyptian master. When his master saw that the Lord was with him, and the Lord gave him success in everything he did, Joseph found favor in his eyes and became his attendant. Potiphar put him in charge of his household, and he entrusted to his care everything he owned. From the time he had put him in charge of his household, and of all that he owned, the Lord blessed the household of the Egyptian because of Joseph. The blessing of the Lord was on everything Potiphar had, both in the house and in the field. So Potiphar left everything he had in Joseph's care. With Joseph in charge, he did not concern himself with anything except the food he ate. Now Joseph was well built and handsome, and after a while, his master's wife took notice of Joseph and said, come to bed with me, but he refused. With me in charge, he told her, my master was concerned with himself with anything in the house. My master does not concern himself with anything in the house. Everything he owns, he has entrusted to my care. No one is greater in this house than I am. My master has withheld nothing from me except you, because you are his wife. How then could I do such a wicked thing and sin against God? And though she spoke to Joseph day after day, he refused to go to bed with her or even be with her. One day he went into the house to attend his duties, and none of the household servants was inside. She called him by his cloak and said, Come to bed with me. But he left his cloak in her hand and ran out of the house. When she saw that he had left his cloak in her hand and had ran out of the house, she called her household servants. Look, she said to them, This Hebrew has been brought to us to make sport of us. He came here to sleep with me, but I screamed. When he heard me scream for help, he left his cloak beside me and ran out of the house. She kept his cloak beside her until his master came home. Then she told him this story. The Hebrew slave you brought us came to me to make sport of me. But as soon as I screamed for help, he left his cloak beside me and ran out of the house. When his master heard the story, his wife told him, saying, This is how your slave treated me. He burned with anger. Joseph's master took him and put him in prison and placed him in the king's placed him where the king's prisoners were confined. But while Joseph was there in prison, the Lord was with him. He showed him kindness and granted him favor in the eyes of the prison warden. So the warden put Joseph in charge of all of those held in the prison, and he was made responsible for all that was done there. The warden paid no attention to anything under Joseph's care because the Lord was with Joseph and gave him success in whatever he did. This is the reading of God's word. Thanks be to God. Will you pray with me? God, we ask always as we come to you that you still our hearts and our minds, that you still the stirring that is within our souls so that we can hear your words spoken to us. We invite you to be present and to allow us to hear with open hearts and open minds, to fill us up and to send us out knowing your truth. May the meditations of my mouth and our hearts be acceptable to you. Amen. So over the last few weeks, we've been looking at the stories of God's promises in the Old Testament, which is sort of chocked full of promises. Genesis is a story about a God who comes into contact and relationship with God's people. We've heard the story of the promise of God to Noah, the promise of God to all of creation, the world, to the people and the animals, and to all of the world, and to God, to never flood the earth again. And then we heard the story to Abraham, the promises that there would be a great nation that comes from Abraham, a people who are blessed through him and by him. And today we hear the story of God's promise to one person. God's promises are getting more and more specific. 
Joseph is from the beginning a dreamer. He has always been a dreamer, and it's sort of the classic tale of the not quite youngest brother. If you're the not quite youngest person in a very large family, you are probably the least noticed of all of the people, right? My dad was four of six, and he swears his mother didn't know his name most of the time. Joseph was a dreamer. He had talent and beauty and skills, and all he was doing was, was tending some sheep in a field. And so his dad gives him a coat, a really special coat, a nice coat, a sort of a consolation prize. He says, I know that you are worth more than this, that you have more talent than this, that, this thing that you're doing. I know you're just raising sheep and there's not a lot I can do about that, but here's a nice coat. Maybe it will help. The dreaming was inevitable whenever you're a person like Joseph, who has more talent, more skill, more beauty than the surroundings allow you to have. And the older brothers were threatened by those dreams. They were threatened by Joseph's hope, Joseph's desire to get out of this situation that they were more than happy to be in. Joseph scared them. He threatened their livelihood. He made them question the value of sheep tending. And so they sold Joseph to some slaves. Some people who were happened to be wandering by, they didn't really care who it was, where they were going, or what was going to happen to Joseph in the end. They decided that they could no longer tolerate the hope. They no longer could deal with the dreams that were too much for them to understand. And Joseph was a little bit of a jerk about it, let's be honest. But Joseph is, throughout this story, a victim he suffers injustice over and over and over and over again, and yet he continues to dream in the midst of that. He continues to remember the promises of God. He continues to remember that God was with Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. Now, there are three people in today's story. There's Potiphar. He's the Egyptian... Um, Official, We don't know much about him. There's no historical records listing a Potiphar anywhere. So we just know that he was somebody who worked for the government. He had a position of authority. And we have Potiphar's wife who, by, by dint of his position, had power in society. And then we had Joseph who worked as a slave in the household. Of course, he's the one who really ran the place. But we couldn't admit that the slave who was in the house was the most important person for the running of the house. Joseph's very being upset the order. Joseph, just by being present and being who he was, made it difficult for the other people to be around him because it no longer allowed them to be content, to be satisfied with easy answers. Joseph was beautiful. The Bible tells us he was well-built and handsome, which is not something we hear the Bible tell us very often. But he was beautiful, and he was wise enough to rise to a place of responsibility and freedom. He could come and go from the house as he needed to go. They trusted him with everything. But it turns out that no amount of beauty in the end, no amount of talent changes the reality that he is a Hebrew. He's a Hebrew. Now, Hebrews are not yet a people group. They're not a country. They're not an ethnicity at this point. Hebrew is a slur. When we hear it in the Old Testament, every time we hear it, Joseph and Samson are the only two times we hear it used over and over and over again. And every time that we hear it, it's a slur. You can think hillbilly or redneck, right? This is a way of saying that Joseph is a person of lower status, lower value in society. Anytime you hear this word, Hebrew, used in this way, it's meant to denigrate, to put somebody down. And no matter Joseph's potential, his talent, his beauty, he would never overcome this. He could never be more than just a Hebrew. Potiphar's wife, on the other hand, even though she was a woman, had position. She had power. She had to have been somebody who was raised in a good family. 
you don't marry into the Egyptian uh, hierarchy unless you were already rich, wealthy, and of status. And so in this situation, she has all of the power. Now we've been to conditioned to expect a Cinderella story. Whenever we hear this, you know, the person cleaning the house, the person of lesser status, and they get, you know, there's a rich person and they get to have the glass slipper, but that is not this story. This is a story of Harvey Weinstein. This is a story of Kevin Spacey, of Jeffrey Epstein. This is a story of an attack. This is the story of countless women and men in shelters. This is the story of a nameless and faceless person who leaves without a word. Has anybody ever left your job and you wondered what happened to him? This is the story of Emmett Till, who if you haven't heard his name, you need to look it up. He was 14 years old and was murdered in 1955 because he offended a white woman. And we know that that's why it happened, because the people who killed him bragged about it afterwards. This is not a Cinderella story. Joseph was attacked by a person who had power over him, and he was put into prison by a person who had power over him because he wasn't, they were embarrassed, and they were afraid. Joseph said no, and he was punished for it. And in the end, it's the response to the assault that is the real injustice here. Because nobody listens to Joseph's story. Nobody believes him. Nobody understands that Joseph is telling the truth. Ten seconds ago, Joseph was the most trusted person in the house. But because the wife held the cards, Joseph was forced to flee. The response made the injustice worse. There was a young girl in Iowa a couple weeks ago, I don't know if you've read the story, who um, was sued by the family of her attacker and is now being forced to repay them $180,000 for the injustice of attacking her attacker to defend herself. The response to the injustice made it worse. Hurt, angry, and embarrassed, Potiphar uses his power and position to punish Joseph. And Joseph, all the time, was simply standing up for his integrity, was simply living up to the person God called him to be, was simply trying to stand up and say, no, this isn't right. And God tells Joseph that this is not the end of the story, that this is not the end of his dream, that this is not the end of all things, that the prison walls in which Joseph found himself did not define him. I define you. Now, there seems to be a lot of argument these days about what justice looks like. It's thrown around a lot. I don't know if you... How, if you live in that world, there's a lot of people throwing around the word injustice and they tack it to whatever their pet issue is. I don't know if, like environmental justice or social justice or climate justice or legal justice or the justice system or lady justice or about 15 other things I could name and my guess is you probably have a pet one stuck in your head somewhere. And I'm here to tell you that none of those, all of those who claim the mantle of God's justice are not God's justice. Because in the end, what they're doing is using God as a prop. They're using that word justice as a prop to say, you know, you have to agree with me, it's the just thing to do. I've put the word justice there. And we've convinced ourselves that as people, we can judge each other, that we can decide what justice is. And in the end, I'm telling you, that the only person who decides what justice is, real justice, is God. And God is always on the side of the vulnerable and the victimized and the oppressed. It's really easy. You look at the Bible almost anywhere. Open it up at random, and there's going to be a story in there of God standing by the person inside the prison walls, 
standing with the person sitting by the pool that's blind and everybody walks by and says, isn't that sad? Standing with the woman who's had multiple husbands and blamed for it. The person who is at the well asking for water but couldn't get water at the well nearby because, boy, she wasn't a good enough person to drink our water, right? God is always with the person who is in need of assistance, is in need of actual restorative justice. The person who just needs a loaf of bread. Elijah and the widow in the wilderness. God doesn't send bread in the famine to the king. He could have. He'd send it to the widow in the forest and to her son who was starving. When the Hebrews crossed the Red Sea, it was Miriam who sings the song of God. It is Miriam who gets the words of blessings, who gets to tell everybody what's in store for them when they cross the river. And it is the barren mother who gives birth to Saul. God is always on the side of the one who doesn't have power, that no one expects to be worth anything, that nobody expects to be any good. God gives them dreams, and in doing so, God gives them hope that they are worth more than what society has told them they are. The Catholics call this the doctrine of extreme unction, which is a great title. We don't have enough good titles like that. And it just means that God gives preference to the poor. God shows preference to the brokenhearted. God shows preference to those who have experienced real injustice. Rejoice and be glad, the psalm tells us, for you, you the victim, you the brokenhearted, you the one who nobody believes even though you're telling the truth, someday, someone, somewhere will stand up for you. Theirs is the kingdom of God. Now, I didn't forget. I did tell you there were three people in this story, and I've only told you about two. We have Potiphar's wife and we have Joseph. They're the stars of the story, but the real villain in this story is Potiphar, who stood by and watched his wife abuse Joseph and did nothing about it. Because he was just a Hebrew. I do have good news for you this morning, though. I know it feels like sometimes there's not good news, but I have good news for you today, and that's this. That while God blesses the vulnerable and the brokenhearted, you may not be one of those people, and you may hear this more as an attack than as a blessing. But I have news for you, and that's this. God also offers blessings to those who are in power. It's Peter in the jail cell who offers grace to the man who jailed him. He said, this is my story, and it can be your story, too. It is Paul seeing light on the road to Damascus and God offering him grace, even though Paul doesn't deserve it. You may be the person who is in a position of power. You may be the person who is in a position to do something about it. And maybe God's grace to you is the opportunity to see that power and to use it for good purposes. God offers blessings to the brokenhearted, but God also offers blessings to men like John Newton, who owned slaves. And one day woke up and realized that he shouldn't be owning other people and devoted his life to God. Who wrote this song, Amazing Grace, how sweet the sound that saves a wretch like me, the slaveholder, the person with power, who too long and too often oppressed other people. And God offers us grace. So I invite you to sing with me and to experience God's grace for you, wherever you are in this story.